Welcome. I'm reporter Soraya Wintersmith. Some of you may recognize my voice from the GBH radio newsroom. Thank you for joining us for this eighth edition of the monthly Beyond the Page book club. A very special thank you to Trident Booksellers and Cafe who partnered with Beyond the Page book club on this event. If you need books, Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. Visit them in-store from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week or on their website 24-7. We're talking today with Emily Gray Tedro, author of The Talented Mrs. Farwell. Before we get started, I wanna give some quick notes about how to participate, just in case anyone is unfamiliar with the format or how we use Zoom. You won't see yourself on video and you won't be able to speak during this event, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. And you can put in your questions at any point during this discussion with the fabulous Emily Gray Tedro. I'll include them after our brief discussion. And we encourage you to ask anything about the book or Emily's writing process, anything. Also, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up and that'll vote that question to the top of the list. And we will do our best to ask the most popular questions. One more thing throughout the event, we will be using the poll feature asking you questions and we're gonna do a test poll right now. You'll see the poll will pop up at the center of your screen. You are able to move this window or close this window to answer the question. Um, but once you answer it, which we would like you to do, uh, the window will uh, disappear. So here's our first poll question. Uh, is this your first Beyond the Page book club event? Is this your first time here? Have you attended some before? Have you attended all of them? So we'll give it a minute. Okay, wow. Okay, so almost, almost, just short of the majority of us are here for the first time. Um, and then 43%, you've attended a few before, and 9% of you, wow, have stuck with us the entire eight times that we've been here. Cool, excellent. Well, welcome again to everyone. Um, for those of you who have stuck through all eight, and for everybody who's just joining for the first time, we're happy to have all of you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Gray Tedrow. Emily Gray Tedro is the Chicago-based author of the novels The Talented Miss Farwell, which we're discussing tonight, Blue Stars, and Commuters. She earned a PhD in English literature from New York University and a BA from Princeton University. She's received an Illinois Art Council Award as well as fellowships from the Ragdale Foundation, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Sewanee Writers Conference. A frequent book reviewer for USA Today, as well as other publications, Tedro also writes essays, interviews, and short stories. I also happen to know that she attributes part of her love of books to her father, the recently retired director of the Darien Library there in Connecticut. Welcome, Emily. Hey, Spraya. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted. The book was fabulous, and I'm so glad for the chance to talk to you about it. Oh, uh, me too. Before we get started, we're going to jump into our second poll question, and that is just to serve as a road guide for tonight. How many of you have finished the book? <laughs> Did you read the whole thing? Are you close to the end? I can't promise that there won't be any spoilers. Did you all finish the book? I finished it. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> All right, 60% of us that are on devoured the whole thing, devoured. 26% almost finished, but don't mind spoilers. And no, I didn't have time, so please warn about spoilers, 14% of you. All right, for those 14%, we will try our best, Emily and I, to make sure that we give you a spoiler warning if we go into spoiler territory. <laughs> Excellent. So let's jump right in. Um, Emily, tell me about Mrs. Farwell's talents. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
Well, so as some of you may have guessed, um, the title is an homage, right, to a very famous work of literature called The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. And in my title, what I'm trying to do is sort of play off that, give a hint that we will be talking about or learning about a, a con artist in the book. But I really wanted to emphasize the female nature of this con artist. And that's something I think we haven't seen a lot of in fiction. Um, so Becky Farwell is growing up in a small Illinois rural town, a place where she um, has a small community and has a parent when she her, she lost her mother early and she grows up in a farming family her dad owns a small farming tools company and she's very smart um she's incredibly gifted at math and as she grows up she begins to use those talents in a way that well let's just say that she gets a little bit into trouble she finds an obsession and she finds a way to fund that obsession in a way that is not entirely legal Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think she's good at lying to herself too. <laughs> oh yeah, for we get sure. Into that a little bit later. Um, we've chatted a bit before, and I know you were somewhat inspired by a real story, um, just yes. loosely, and you heard it on the radio, which made me happy to hear. Can oh, you yeah. tell us a little bit about that and why it is that that story captured your imagination? For sure. Yes. So I'm here in Chicago, and. Um, Let's see, earlier, about 10 years ago, uh, there was a breaking news story that I happened to hear on NPR while I was driving my kids around. I'm, I'm a mom too, so I was uh, carpooling my kids and NPR broke in with a breaking news story about a woman who had been arrested by the FBI in her tiny Illinois town and was indicted for embezzling $50 million over 20 years, what would turn out to be in fact, the greatest municipal fraud in American history. So of course I was interested, but the thing that really grabbed me as a writer and as a novelist was when the um, news reporter mentioned that the FBI had held off of arresting this woman, arresting this person for some time, even after they had sufficient evidence for her crimes, because as they put it, they didn't believe a woman alone could pull off this epic of a crime. So I don't know, I, that really grabbed me. I. Um, I was fascinated, but then Soraya, I did this thing that writers often do where I stopped following the actual news story itself. I didn't wanna to know too much about the person you know, who actually lived this crime. I wanted to create space to imagine my own char character, Becky Farwell. So um, it is loosely inspired on something that did transpire here in Illinois, but I really uh, kind of took it to a different place, I think, um, for fiction. Mm -hmm. I imagine that's maybe a little bit more liberating when you have an idea and a framework and you have a lot of space to play, to fill it in. Um, is that yeah, true? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's best case scenario in my mind is to have, you know, like a sort of a springboard that you can launch off of with then the freedom to go where you want. Um, so for example, um, I knew for some time that I had wanted to set a novel in the world of the art collecting world, in the high priced, high status world of contemporary art. And I thought that this might be the perfect place for a con artist and a person who is kind of living a double life um, and is obsessed with collecting art to, you know, this might be a perfect arena to kind of uh, let this uh, story play out. So it was really great for me because that none of that transpired in the actual um, lived crime. And I was able to kind of make that up and use that as um, the place in which to set Becky Farwell loose. And to that end of setting Becky Farwell loose, when we first meet her in the book, she is a teenager in this town of Pearson. And I think you have an excerpt from when we first first meet Becky, would you mind reading? I would love to, yes. I'd love to give you guys just um, the most brief taste of where we meet Becky at the very beginning of the novel. Um, so this is um, The Talented Miss Farwell. It's chapter one, Pearson, Illinois, 1979. 14 year old Becky Farwell lay on the truck horn with her forearm. Daddy, let's go. Engine running, she tilted the rear view to study her eye makeup, 
a wash of greens running light, dark to light from her eyelashes to eyebrows. Greens, of course, because all the magazines said all redheads had to, even indistinct blonde red mixes like her own. What she really wanted was the set that gave you three kinds of purple, pale violet to dusky eggplant. Becky ran a quick calculation on how much she was owed by the four girls she did homework for, geometry and algebra, although she could stretch up to pre-calc too, even as a ninth grader. Though for pre-calc, all she could guarantee was a B, not that any of the girls complained. Sometimes she took payment in shoes, like the almost new tree torns she had on now, without socks, because no one did. Becky flipped the mirror back with a snap. They needed cash too bad to daydream about makeup. Getting squeezed at all ends. One of her father's sayings that didn't make sense, but sure as hell got across how bad it was that spring. After another minute, she jumped down from the truck and went inside. Even though it was one of the first nice days in March, the front, window, the front rooms of their farmhouse were dark and stuffy, closed in. Becky pushed up a window and propped it open with a can of beans. This morning's cereal bowls were tumbled milky white in the sink and a thin sticky layer of grease and dust filmed everything, but Becky had no time to wipe it up. In the family room, one patch of carpet stood out darker and new. Last week, her father had pawned the TV set, all her mother's jewelry, he thought all, Becky had hidden a few bits, and the blender. He wouldn't tell her how much he'd gotten, it's only temporary but the crumpled receipt she'd found proved it was less than a hundred. Daddy, she called from the bottom of the stairs, then ran up lightly, bracelets jingling. We have to, have you not even showered? For there he was, her bear-like father, curled on his side in bed, his silver hair mashed down low over his forehead, perspiration speckling his nose. Stomach flu, but there was no time for it. A buyer was driving in from Rockford, and her father was supposed to meet him at noon. So I'll stop there. Excellent, thank you. And so begins the journey. Um, I have to say, I really enjoyed reading this because when you start there, there are so many things that I think come full circle for me. And I see Becky address them later as an adult um, mm -hmm. and sometimes differently. Um, and spoiler alert for those of you who want to know <laughs> why did you think that it was important for the audience to meet Becky here at this point in her life yeah that's actually a great question I think what I needed to show at the beginning of this novel is Becky um up against the odds in her life she is a teenager and her father is losing his business and they are about to um, really hit the financial straits here. And so what I wanted to show was the way that Becky is able to use her own smarts because actually she will be the one who can save her father's business and turn it around. And by doing that, she gets the first sign for herself that she has these gifts in terms of finances, in terms of numbers, in terms of working with men in the farming industry who don't expect her to be able to have those kinds of skills. So to me, meeting Becky here is kind of a preview for what she's gonna be doing a little bit later on in life when she turns her attention from work that is uh, legit to the stuff that she needs to do to fulfill this obsession that she comes to have around art, visual art. Mm. And I saw early on too um, that deceit was kind of passed down, maybe not as a value, but as a thing that is normal, at least among her and her father. And then we see that play out as she gets older. Um, yeah. That frustrated me a little bit. There's a point in the middle of my copy of the book where I'm like, this woman is a sociopath. <laughs> and I wrote, I wrote it. Some people may not feel the same, but I think we can all agree that Becky uh, at best is a person who struggles with conscience. Um, yes. You dreamt her. Did you consider Becky a sociopath? And was it hard writing somebody who struggles with the truth? You know, Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I faced um, I faced something that, frankly, a lot of writers face when they're writing women characters who are less than perfect, right? Mm -hmm. When they're writing criminals, when they're writing uh, women who mess up, have mistakes, uh, do make bad choices. 
there's a pretty strong social kind of prohibition against writing women who are, as the parlance goes, unlikable. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was running a risk by writing about someone who lies and steals um, and does that in, in the heart of her own community. Mm -hmm. But I think my challenge was to tell the story of this big life, this big, epic, messy life, and to see what I could find in it that readers would respond to, perhaps empathize with on a human level, while at the same time holding in their mind the fact that, um, yes, stealing $50 million is generally considered wrong, right? But we can we can hold that in our mind and still enjoy, you know, the sort of adventures of someone who is um, a criminal. We can, you know, so that was, that was kind of my challenge in writing it. But yes, I agree it was a, a stretch, you know. And um, what's your process for creating the internal dialogue of somebody who is, I think there's a point, there are a couple points in the book where like, there's a point where you can get out and correct everything, but then we experience her having her internal dialogue and saying, no, nah, just one more time, just one more time. What's your process for creating that internal dialogue? Right, you're so right. There are several moments over the course of the years as Becky um, commits her crime, which consists of her um, embezzling money from the small town government office where she works, using it to buy works of art, and then selling some of those works back to make a profit and then plug the money back in. So she does that. So she's able to tell herself, like Soraya, she's able to like kind of almost rationalize the crime by saying, I am paying it back, most of it, but the gap gets bigger and bigger. And so I think my process was to really sort of um, wonder what it would be like, to, I mean, how would you have to live? How would you have to compartmentalize? What kind of psychology would you have? What would you have to tell yourself to believe that you could continue stealing from the office that you showed up at every day, right? The small town where you know your neighbors and you go to church with them and you, you know, meet people for coffee and it's, you know, um, everyone that you've always known your entire life. Mm -hmm. To me, that was kind of the, maybe the driving force for why I wanted to write this novel. I wanted to see what it would look like to live a life like that, where you have a double life. You are concealing an entire story behind everyone who's known you from birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you capture like the visceral reaction that somebody has when they look at art and they're moved, which I think is really, really hard to do. I know that when I see a piece of art and I'm struck by it in the first couple of minutes that I'm drawn to it, mm. I can't really say, even though I write for a living, I can't really say why I am attracted to this piece mm. immediately. It takes me some time. And I wondered, are you, into art? And if not, how did you decide that Becky would be in that world? Yes. So I do love art, but I think I love it in a very different way from Becky Farwell. I mean, I should say that I have no like art background. I approach it purely as someone who just likes to go to museums and always has. But I, I see art maybe like, I mean, when I see an, a painting I like, I, my mind sort of gets in the way. I'm thinking too much. I, sometimes I don't even look at the painting. I'm, I'm too busy reading the info, you know, that they put on the card next to it. <laughs> and I have to remind myself, take it in. So I, what I wanted to give Becky was kind of the opposite of that. Like she is somebody who experiences art in a full on sensory physical way. And she has that kind of eye that you're just either given or you're not. So she's able to see art and kind of get it on a gut level, um, which is something I don't have, but I think would be a fascinating experience. So I had fun creating that character trait for her. If you're just joining us, welcome. We're talking with Emily Gray Tedrow, author of The Talented Miss Farwell. One quick reminder, if you want to ask Ms. Tedro questions, use the Q&A tab that's located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, if you see a question you like, give it a thumbs up and that'll help boost it to the top and we'll try and get to those questions as our discussion goes along. Um, Emily, how did you familiarize yourself with the art wheeling and dealing world? Yes, so that was kind of tricky. Um, I, you know, I, I want to say that I, I've kind of followed the art world just with an interest. So for example, you know, if a new artist biography comes out, I'll often read it. I like to read magazines such as Vanity Fair. They cover the art world really well. 
Um, and then, you know, there have been a few books published by collectors um, describing their life and, and there's a few documentaries. So I watched those and I read those, but honestly, I made it up a lot of the time. Um, and I sort of wanted to kind of um, give that some drama and some tension that it might not always have in real life. Um, but to me, it's a very exciting, powerful thing. The fact that you could, for example, if you had that much money, buy an incredible work of art to own in your home. Mm -hmm. So um, honestly, that's to me, one of the joys of being a fiction writer is that you get to um, play out an imaginative scenario that you are really interested in. So I, a lot of times I would think to myself, what would I do if I had that kind of money? And if I really wanted to buy that piece of art, how would I go about it? So <laughs> a lot of times I just made it up. Nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> I think I wanna ask you both generally and then specifically with this piece of work, just given that the little spark of inspiration happened because you were listening to a news story, how much of what goes on in the news cycle and then maybe by extension, like the public psyche, how much does that play into what you're writing? Yeah, that's actually, that's really interesting. And when I think about it now, for me, one of the challenges with the talented Miss Farwell is that it takes place over a number of years. Um, mm -hmm. It spans, I think, 20 years. And I had never written a book with that kind of timeline. So one of the things I did was I um, created with these giant sheets of paper, you know, my kids have all this like giant construction paper. I created a timeline um, with my characters' actions, and then I researched what was happening in the news, um, you know, in those years. So I was able to, for example, I think I have Becky reacting to a news story that she hears on the car radio. And I think that, you know, if there was a major storm or if there was a presidential election, I found a way to kind of connect my character to that timeline. So for me, it is, it is really important to have a character living in the world. You know, mm -hmm. um, I like that in realistic fiction. I, I like seeing how people in stories are living in the same kind of world that you and I live. Um, and so that is definitely important to me, what's going on in the public psyche, as well as in the, in the heart of the character I'm writing. Okay. And then a little bit more specifically, when I read towards the end, the chain of events where Becky is trying to secure what she's trying to secure and she, you know, cozies up to the family so she can try and get the last little piece for her collection that she wants. Um, I saw entitlement and I know that whole idea of like white privilege is permeating the news cycle. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that burdened you or if you were worried because you, you published in September of 2020 and that was pretty close to like big news conversations that were happening around race. And I think people have said racial reckoning now, mm -hmm. were you worried about how people would receive that. And were you burdened by that idea at all as you were writing? Yeah, I mean, this is a really, this is something I reflect on, I reflected on a lot while writing and at the time the book came out and um, thinking about Black Lives Matter and the racial reckoning movement has been a big part of my daily life. And at times I have been unhappy that my book centers a white, woman in a world in a, in a starting from a rural world that is mostly white and when she moves into bigger cities she's able to meet with more diverse characters but she does use her privilege she uses her whiteness she uses her you know her found later in life money um, as a way to get what she wants and she is manipulative and i don't think she is above manipulating um you know, using her whiteness as a way to get to the, the, the storyline you're referring to, a Black artist's um, sort of back catalog. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, a character trait that makes her um, despicable to some and problematic. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, I think that is part of her uh, sort of big messy life. And it is something for her to reckon with. It's something for me as a white mm -hmm. author to reckon with. And um, frankly, it's something that we all should be talking about more. So I welcome the question. Mm -hmm. And are you ever like worried? Does it ever play into like what you're writing? Like, I wonder how people will think or feel about this. I think so, yes. I mean, I have to, 
put a hold on that sometimes while I'm writing or else I won't be able to access any kind of creative energy. I think if I was worried about what people will think, I would write in a different way. But mm -hmm. Um, for example, now, as I consider kind of going ahead with a next project, this is when I let it all in and I think, okay, what's going on in the world? How have I changed? What have I learned? What am I listening to? You know, who are the people that I want to listen to as I continue to write and, you know, be a public writer and put books out into the world? So I would say that, you know, in between works is kind of more when I take in, um, you know, who I want to be and what I want, what I want to be listening to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any like interesting or weird writing quirks that you're willing to tell us about that you have to try and suppress in doing this? <laughs> well, I'll say that um, for the talented Miss Farwell, for the first time, I wrote the entire first draft by hand. Um, I stayed off the computer entirely. Wow. I just used pads and, and a pen. And I think I did that because, you know, as we all know, you know, the computer is just like your basic procrastination, you know, dream. And so that was helpful to stay away from social media. But I think it also gave me a little bit more freedom. It felt more private while I was creating the story. Um, and it was portable. So I am, you know, uh, the main caregiver to two kids. And there's a lot of picking them up and dropping them off and school and homework and, you know, taking them around town. And I was able to bring my notebook and, you know, I'm that person you see scribbling in the notebook um, while they're waiting for their kid to finish volleyball practice. So um, that was kind of a fun, new, helpful thing with this novel that I enjoyed. And um, tell me about dealing with the emotional impact of like creating a character and now we know you're in analog mode and writing, writing their life play out. I think that this, I mean, I had the most fun creating the character and the storyline of Becky Farwell than I've had for any of my previous writing experiences. And maybe that's because I was writing someone who is living a life completely different from mine. Um, and maybe it's because there was more action and drama in this story than I've ever written before. But it was one of those experiences where it just like, I could see her pretty much whole from the beginning of the novel as I worked on it. And I was able to really kind of feel that you, um, that, that, that I could have fun following her along these adventures. You know, it, it wasn't work creating who she was. It felt pretty easy. And, you know, I can only hope that that comes again because it was, it was a pretty great experience. <laughs> <laughs> and was it heavy thinking about um, Patricia Highsmith and you wanting to pay homage a little bit when you're writing in the vein of someone that you admire and respect, was that heavy? You know, point? you'd think so, and I definitely had that on like a little post-it on my um, on my board with a couple other you know inspirations. But I didn't come to the title for this novel until much later in the process. Like mm -hmm. I think even before you know, even when the book was in the pre-publication mode, I'm not sure I had settled on a title. So it didn't feel like this heavy homage, you know, anxiety. It was um, something that I think I used as energy. And then when I came to the title later, it seemed perfect. And I was happy to have it be kind of a nod towards Patricia Highsmith, who did write, you know, a definitive con artist novel for our time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see some questions populating our Q&A. Before we go to those, I wanna pause and introduce the team behind tonight's event. They are managing the technology and connecting with you, but most of the time you don't see or hear from them, except for now. Jen Gilcrest is our event producer overseeing the whole virtual production. Hey, Jen. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. I have had such a great time listening to the conversation so far, and I can't wait to get to the audience questions. So let's get to it. Back behind the scenes, Jen goes. Liz Hagyard is keeping an eye on our Q&A box. Liz, say hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm looking forward to the conversation. As a reminder, put your comments and your questions in the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen. Let us know your name, where you're tuning in from, and ask your questions, and we'll be happy to respond to as many of them as we can. Thanks for joining us. Back to you, Soraya. Excellent. Thanks, Jen and Liz. Now let's hear from Sandy Chin, Associate Director of our Leadership Circle Program about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the page, but all the virtual events we continue to provide. Sandy, welcome. Hi everyone, thank you, Soraya. 
Thank you so much for spending time with us tonight during tonight's Beyond the Page event. How wonderful to be here with all of you and a special applause to those who have joined us in each edition so far. There's something so meaningful about a community of people brought together by a book. And the great thing about books and GBH is both are commercial free. GBH is member supported and that means we're here because you want us here. Our commercial free status also means we count on your support. And if you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you will receive an autographed copy of Emily Tidrow's book Commuters as a thank you gift. And as we navigate this ever-changing landscape, financial support from our donors keeps us going strong. Please give $5 a month or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. And it's so easy. Please go to wgbh.org slash support events or click on that link you see in the chat and contribute what you can. And thank you. And now back to Soraya. Thanks, Sandy. All right, it's time for your questions. Remember to use the Q&A function. No need to wait, jump right in and ask. What I see at the top is from Lynn Levy. Uh, so Emily, Becky seems to have an odd relationship with men. Can you explain that? Yes, great question. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to do when I was creating this character, when I, when I wanted to tell the story of Becky Farwell, I wanted it to be that her main relationship is with herself and with her obsession and with the need that she has sort of been given with whatever for, through whatever reason to create to collect this art and i wanted relationships like human relationships to be secondary to her and i think that one of the things that i noticed about um women in fiction is that when we have a woman who's sort of um, breaking bad, uh, one of the ways we mostly get it is through um, her relationships, right? She might cheat on a husband or leave her kids or, you know, um, abandon her family. Mm -hmm. And I love those novels. I think I've maybe written some of that too. But in this case, I really wanted to focus on a woman whose um, main priority is her work and her work for her is this criminal activity that she's building. So, well, what, right. The activity is what she calls it to herself in her own private language. So, you know, Becky Farwell's a human. Uh, she does have uh, brief affairs. She is not someone who is, you know, um, sort of like an automaton or a robot, but you know, her relationship with men is such that, you know, it's pretty transactional for her. And I think the most important thing for her is getting back to her work and her art. And that was a, you know, in an intentional choice I made. We touched on this a little bit, but Andrea asks, of all the various crimes you could have chosen for Becky slash Reba to commit, why did you choose art? Hmm. I think the art world um, was compelling to me, um, not just because I enjoy looking at visual art, but because there is a lot about art and the art world where value is in question, where um, what something appears to be isn't always what it is, where a painting can turn on a dime and what was worth a um, million dollars could be worth, you know, a hundred dollars the next day. Um, so to me that like shifting kind of, um, you know, disguise filled arena was a really good one for Becky who was struggling to know how to present herself and how to grow into this persona who can, you know, kind of adopt this more cosmopolitan attitude, that this would be a good place um, for her to uh, kind of uh, create her activity. Um, I, so I think I used it kind of because I like the art world, but also a little bit in a metaphorical way for mm. Becky's crimes. Mm. That makes sense. Uh, Carol Rousemitt says, after you finished the book, did you ever go back and find out more information about the real event? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a couple great ways anyone who's interested can find more. There's a, a, an excellent documentary made by a former colleague of mine at DePaul University here in Chicago. And the documentary's name is All the Queen's Horses. I believe you can even find it for free, maybe on YouTube. Um, and so that's an excellent um, overview of the woman uh, who committed this crime in real life. 
Um, but I did read a bit about her and I was careful to, um, one thing I did keep that is the same in my novel um, are the numbers. So the, uh, my fictional character uh, embezzles the same amount of money over the same amount of years um, as the, you know, the person in, in real life. So um, I, I learned enough afterwards to kind of fact check a, a few of my numbers. Um, but I recommend All the Queen's Horses as a really excellent documentary if you're interested in the real situation. Excellent. Lynn Levy asking another popular question. This is such a great story. Have you considered writing a screenplay and making it into a movie? <laughs> well, I love that idea. Um, I have never written a screenplay and wouldn't know the first thing about it. But there have been a couple perhaps positive signs in that direction. I mm -hmm. would hope that, you know, if enough people think it might make a good uh, TV or, or film project that that might move forward. So listen, I'll just uh, keep my fingers crossed that that question comes to pass. So we're putting it out there in the universe right exactly. here. You heard it first here. Exactly. Um, Mary Lenore Kessler says, I am a pediatrician and I'm interested in the nature versus nurture question you present in Becky's character. Could you comment? Oh, wow, that is fascinating. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear that question. Yes, so I guess one of the things that maybe is behind that question is what, what creates somebody who can do this kind of epic crime, right? What, what creates a con artist? What creates a Bernie Madoff or um, an Elizabeth Holmes? I, I think that's her name, the woman from Theranos. Um, uh, you know, I think that for Becky, it must be a mix because, you know, she suffered some trauma early on in life with losing her mother at a very early age and then the sort of potential stress of her father's business failing. There's also an incident early on in the novel where she's um, sexually assaulted um, by a man in her father's uh, sh agricultural showroom. So she grows up in a way, I think, in which her natural anger and fear about these events is channeled into some unnatural ways. And I think that um, to me, her sort of the righteous ambition of a young passionate woman who's exceedingly intelligent. And when that's frustrated by um, a sort of the environment in which she grows up in, I think that the nurture aspect plays a lot into how she develops. Um, that's not to say that people, I mean, of course, people the world over have difficult scenarios and don't turn to a life of crime. But um, for me, yeah, I don't think she's born this mega mind, you know, uh, master criminal. I think there was a lot of choices along the way um, and a lot of life um, events that played into how she became who she became. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kathy says, I was perplexed at how she was so oblivious to the damage she was doing to Pearson, a town she cared about. After the first year or so, paying the money back wasn't going to undo the damage to the town. Not a question, but could you comment a little bit more about um, yeah. Becky? Kathy says she seems that Becky is oblivious to what she's doing. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that that is in part an intentional obliviousness. I think that Becky can't allow herself to fully comprehend the damage that she has done over the years. And she has this delusion, right, that, you know, she can pay it back. Um, she can get this money and put it back in the in the um, the bank account and then and then she'll be square. But of course, that's not the way it works, right? She's really hurt people, real people over time, um, people who are close to her. Mm -hmm. But I think in order for her to maintain you know, what she feels like she needs to do, she has to create this belief system that allows her to think that she is sort of, you know, keeping the books even. Um, and, and to me, that is uh, one of the sort of painful parts towards the end, which I will guess I'll, I'll give a little spoiler alert. If you want to mute now, go ahead. But um, there's a scene towards the end of the novel where uh, one of her closest friends, Ingrid, perhaps her only close friend, um, really lets her have it and lets her know the true damage that Becky's crime has done to her sort of best friend. Mm -hmm. And Becky is stunned in a way that is a little bit unbelievable. If you don't, 
if you if you think that you know most of us would understand how we would hurt someone but becky has a different kind of a perspective and she has allowed herself to be deluded and to think that she was taking care of her friend in certain ways and that scene at the end is meant to really bring home to the reader and to becky um, the long lasting damage of her of her crime right uh carol griffin perfectly timed. Could you comment more on Becky's relationship with her best friend? It seems like a true friendship as much as Becky can have a good friend, um, though Becky is obviously very deceptive with Ingrid. Yes, it's true. I think that puts it perfectly. As much as Becky can allow herself to have connection, I believe it's with Ingrid, her close friend in the town. And one of the things that she and Ingrid share is that they have both stayed with their small town, um, which is sort of a, a, a failing town, right? So an agricultural place where jobs have left and people are sort of sliding down the economic scale. Um, most people leave once they have you know, reached the age, but she and Ingrid chose to stay for different reasons and they become close by that fact and also by the fact that Ingrid, um, for whatever reason, can see in Becky some things to love. And she sort of insists that Becky be loved. And Becky doesn't always want to be, but um, the two of them have a sort of a, a, a strange alliance and a friendship that lasts over time. And in her own way, Becky is trying to give to Ingrid. And she is, for example, trying to take care of Ingrid's special needs son by paying for his treatments and his tutoring and his therapist, something that Ingrid herself can't afford. But of course, she's paying for it with dirty money. And um, this is a painful thing that will come out later. But as it goes, Becky wants to tell herself that, you know, she needs she wants to take care of Ingrid and this is the way she feels she can so to me it's sort of like a a sad but somewhat um heartening thing that Becky feels like she wants to give it's just that she's you know this is the only way in which she feels that she is able to give to Ingrid hmm. and reader uh asks is completism the goal of getting all the works of art from a particular artist era etc a trend that exists in the art world? That's a good question. And I've been asked this before. And my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and, um, it, very it very well may be. And I know I have heard the term completist or completism. I've mostly heard it about people like, for example, who collect other objects. Or if, if for example, you're a Steven Soderbergh completist, you see all of his films, right? Or if you are a, I don't know, I was going to use a sports metaphor, but I better not because I'll get it wrong. And I'm from New York originally, and I know you Boston um, people don't like when we talk sports from New York. <laughs> I know, I know. But in terms of the art world, I'm not sure. What I meant the term to do is to show how Becky has kind of boxed herself into a corner at the end of her uh, life as a career criminal and an art collector. She's not able to really almost enjoy art the way she used to. She has to create these kind of more and more elaborate mental games as a way of setting herself these challenges, which she then can either succeed at or fail. So to me, it's a kind of a personal, private, almost like, um, you know, rules that Becky sets up for herself to up the ante. Um, but as for whether people today are collecting like that, I, I, I couldn't say. Fascinating. Um, you said at the beginning, you allowed your imagination to go wild and you made a lot of stuff up. It's true. Um, who would you choose to play Becky in the movie? Let's, let's let your imagination go Ooh, wild again. <laughs> let's do that. I don't know. Um, gosh, who do you think, Soraya? I don't see a ton of movies these days. Um, one person that has come to mind, mainly because I gave Becky red hair for some mm -hmm. reason, she's mm -hmm. a red haired person, um, is the actress uh, Emma Stone, who okay. I saw in La La Land, which I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she's a fabulous actor. Um, and, you know, I think she has red hair or she did in a movie I saw and she seems like she'd be fabulous. So Emma, call me, we'll talk. <laughs> But I'd be curious if anyone else has ideas. I, I think that's a fun question. We're putting it out there again. Um, one thing that I was curious about, I know it turned into an audiobook also. Did you yes. play a role in that process? 
you know, I was able to um, help choose the narrator and that was really wonderful. Um, there are some people who specialize, I mean, maybe everyone knows this, but specialize in, in voice narration, in reading um, out loud and they're fabulous at it as people who love audiobooks know. Um, so I was given a choice of a couple people and I was so happy with the person that we ended up with. Her name's Allison Ryan. And I think that um, when I heard, the, heard her performance of the novel, it really did sound a lot like how I hear it in my head. And so that was really wonderful for me as a, as a writer. Um, I see, this is a good question. Um, did you want the audience to sympathize with Becky slash Reba or did you want us to want her to get caught? I definitely found myself oscillating between frustration mm. and sympathy. Is that what you were going for? Is that how you meant to present her? Absolutely. Um, I went between frustration and sympathy as I was writing her. Um, you know, this is uh, again, the story of a, a criminal and we're inside her point of view. So it's hard not to sympathize a little bit with a point of view character, right? Um, anyone from Camus' The Stranger to Highsmith's, uh, you know, the talented Mr. Ripley, when you're that close into a character's mind and heart and his, his or her thoughts, it's natural for us to sympathize with that human story. Um, on the other hand, of course, we are in the world and, and we are good people and we believe that you should not um, embezzle $50 million and that if you do, you sh there's justice should be served. So I did want there to be a tension there. In fact, I think that was one of my main goals in writing this book. So if people found it kind of confusing or confounding their different feelings about her, then I think that's probably something that I'd be happy with. You definitely did it for me. <laughs> uh, Becky often spoke Pagano. Becky often spoke of the music she was listening to on the radio. Yes. Do you and Becky share the same taste in music or was that just a play on what was popular in the timeline of the story? Okay, here's where I admit that I too <laughs> listen to some cheesy country music sometimes. So thank you for that question. Um, you know, I did want Becky's sort of interests to be strong and specific um, and her taste in clothing, her taste in food, her taste in music. To me, those details are really what kind of create a work of fiction that really, you know, is persuasive and, and believable. Um, so I did have Becky be a, a, um, a country music fan. And I wouldn't say I know a ton about that, but it is something I'm interested in. And um, uh, she meets Ingrid, for example, at a concert uh, where the Judds perform. They're a famous mother-daughter uh, duo. And um, I think I like a few songs by the Judds. So I would say, I think I do share a little bit of the musical tastes that Becky um, is into. My kids are gonna be so embarrassed if they ever, I mean, I have two teenagers who would just fall on the floor if I, if they knew I was admitting on public radio, public TV, uh, that I liked uh, the Judds, sorry, <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. When they get older, they will probably play the music for themselves and then think yes. about you. That's uh, right. An anonymous attendee asks, you mentioned making your grand timeline. How long did it take you to write this book? Were there any other, or was there any other extensive research needed? Mm, that's a great question. And um, this book took a long time for me because it does take place over so many years. And that was a challenge I'd never, you know, set myself in writing before. So I would say that start to finish writing a draft of the book doesn't take too long. I think for me, maybe a year, but there was extensive kind of working out of the timeline, that was tricky. I also had to manage um, the money. So I have her embezzling certain sums of money, you know, as she goes over the months and the years. And as I'm writing it, I'm in this frame of mind of like, you know, la-di-da, you know, X, X thousand here, you know, X 10,000 there. And then it comes time when your publisher has a copy editor and a fact checker, and they're asking you questions about, well, this doesn't really add up, Emily, to, you know, X million dollars. And so I actually had to go back and do some math, which is not my strong suit. Um, so that was pretty difficult. And I did need to go um, research, you know, kind of um, 
some stuff around her work as an accountant. That was also something that's sort of her day job, her cover job. And I didn't know much about that, but luckily I had some wonderful people who offered to help me and tell me about their jobs. And I was able to kind of get some um, insider info that way. Did you keep a schedule and did you try and set a goal for how much writing you were doing each day by hand? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do like to write um, every day. I'd like to at least look at the document um, or the page every day, even if I don't actually get a lot of writing done. And I would say that on a good day, my goal is usually around 500 to 1000 words a day. Mm. And I, I, you know, when I teach, sometimes I I always remind students and especially writers who have jobs as I do and maybe kids or people they're taking care of that you don't need to write for eight hours a day. That's not how most novelists work. I mean, if you can fit in a good hour of writing a day, that's how most novels get made. It just, you know, accrues over time. So um, that's how I do it. Another anonymous attendee is asking, what are you working on next? Have you started on your next book? Well, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I think what I'm doing is working on something. I'm not sure if it's a novel or the next novel, but it's definitely something that I wanted to do um, to kind of take me away from the very difficult you know, situation we have going on right now with the pandemic and quarantine. I really wanted something fun. I wanted something um, a little bit lighter. I did not want a ton of criminal activity in this novel. So, um, and, I, and I wanted some warm weather. So I think I kind of put those elements together and I'm messing around with something that seems to be kind of on the funny side, perhaps, we'll see. Um, and mainly it's just fun for me to work on. So we'll, we'll see if it ever makes it um, out of the computer into a book. Are you getting any writer's block these days? And if so, how are you addressing it? You know, I tend to not really get writer's block. Um, wow. I remember, you know, as a younger writer, I, I was a little bit confused about writer's block because I was kind of like, well, does that mean you don't want to write? Because you don't often want to write <laughs> in my experience. I mean, it's kind of like exercise in that way, but you're never unhappy that you have written. So, um, I always just sort of made myself do it. I think the thing is that I just, maybe I, I lower my standards a lot um, <laughs> when I'm feeling kind of like it's hard. Um, and, you know, so, but of course right now, you know, it's been a stressful time, right? For everybody. And attention is something that's like very um, fractured, I think for a lot of us. So luckily, you know, my my practice and is more about having fun with this new project. So that takes the pressure off. Um, but I can understand, you know, I think if I were in the thick of writing this novel right now, that would be a big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm grateful that I wrote it last year and the year before, as opposed to working on it this year. Uh, another question that got some thumbs up from Kathy. Why did you choose the ending? She was basically a decent person but she never did stop the con. So is, can you say that again? Why did I choose how, is it, why did I choose the ending of the, the end? Why did you choose the ending? So I guess this is where we'll give another spoiler alert yes. um, and say that, um, yes, so Becky does get caught at the end of the novel. And that was always going to be my intention for writing this because, um, first of all, the person in the true life story did get caught and arrested. And that is, of course, how I found out about this. And it gave me the idea. But I think I wanted to talk about the beginning, middle and end of her arc as a criminal. And I end the novel um, with her in prison, if those of you who've read it know. Um, and then I move away from her story and kind of leave her there with a sense of how she's going to get through her prison years. And to me, I chose that ending because I felt like it most truly represented reality, um, the realistic ending of this. Um, we don't know about con artists until they are caught, right? Um, and so I didn't want it to be kind of, um, and in this way, I, I, I diverge from how Patricia Highsmith has Tom Ripley continually evading the cops and continuing to kind of, you know, book after book, he's sort of, you know, almost getting caught, but then not really. 
Um, but her series is more of a kind of a mystery series. And my novel really um, is meant to be more in the realistic uh, arena. So ending in prison is maybe, uh, I felt like what was kind of true and natural and right for this particular story. Mm -hmm. In prison and still thinking about pictures, it almost felt like there was space for a sequel. Is oh gosh. <laughs> is this true? Well, not that I've thought of Soraya, but you know, <laughs> never say never, I guess. <laughs> Um, tell me about what you're reading right now. We only have a little bit more time and I'm curious what is inspiring you, getting your creative yeah. juices flowing. Who are you reading? Yeah, so I just finished a, a novel that um, I really enjoyed and it's a novel, um, it's new and it's a first novel by an author um, named Brandon Taylor. And it's the author, the novel's called Real Life. Um, and it's a kind of a, a captivating look at a, a young man in a science program. Um, he is queer, he's black, and he's really struggling with some kind of like um, central questions of identity. And um, it was pretty mesmerizing. I tore through it uh, over the past week and I, you know, I really recommend it. So I read Real Life by Brandon Taylor. And then the other novel that I think has recently really captivated me is um, called A Boy in the Field by Margot Livesey. Um, and this is a, an, also a novel that came out this year, and it is by um, a writer who I really love, who's kind of a contemporary master of the novel and short story form. And it's about a, a group of teenagers who find a very injured boy in a field, um, and how that discovery kind of ricochets throughout their lives in the ensuing years. So it's one of those that almost has the quality of like a fairy tale. Um, it's short and powerful. So mm -hmm. those two novels I, I highly recommend. And they, they really reminded me um, why, you know, just why I love to read and, and why I like being a writer. Excellent. So now we know what's inspiring you. We'll look out for your um, movie manuscript because we put it out into the universe. We put it out into the universe and we're all excited for it. Um, Emily, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time for this edition of Beyond the Page Book Club. I wanna thank all of you so much for tuning in to this month's discussion. A very, very special thank you to Emily, uh, not only for joining us tonight, but for penning a look at the life of a con artist with a glimpse <laughs> into the competitive art world. Thank you, Soraya. I just wanna thank everyone at Beyond the Page and WGBH, Trident Booksellers. This was really wonderful. Thanks to all of you all for tuning in tonight. Thank you. Join Beyond the Page over the coming weeks as the book club takes a dive into its January selection. The club's next reading will be a classic work of literature, All Creatures Great and Small. And the club will be talking with Ben Vanstone, who's the lead writer of the Masterpiece series adaptation, which will also be premiering this January. So you'll have a chance to learn about what it's like to write for a show inspired by a classic work of literature. So a little bit of a switch up next time. Uh, the virtual conversation will take place on a new day in time, Sunday, January 10th, 2020 at noon. Uh, don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. And now another quick message from Sandy about how you can show your support. GBH and Beyond the Page aim to serve our audience in a way that not only educates, but also entertains, inspires, and shares diverse perspectives. We rely on financial support from members to keep offering programs and virtual events like this one. If you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you will receive a copy of Commuters signed by Emily as a token of our appreciation. You can help more stories brought to life on television, radio, and on digital platforms, please visit wgbh.org slash support events to make that $60 donation all at once or give $5 a month and we'll say thank you and send you your autographed copy of Commuters. Just click that chat link to be brought to our site and thank you for spending tonight with us and thanks moreover for your support. Happy reading and happy holidays, everyone. Thanks so much, Sandy. We look forward to connecting with you again, and we hope that you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this time.
Thanks so much, guys.